Lucky, let me show you around the place called Speaker's Corner. Oh, oh, after this, can we go find Gordon Ramsay? What? Why? Because I want him to cook me some salmon. I absolutely love salmon. I don't think he'd... Salmon! Fine, fine. Yeesh. Go get your stupid Ramsay baked salmon. Wait a second. What's going on over here? First thing, was on the you're a Trinitarian Christian, yes? Yeah. Are you a Trinitarian Christian? Liz, 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 are you a Trinitarian Christian? You're trying to change. Are you a Trinitarian Christian? No, because we're talking Jesus here. Do you believe Jesus is one part of the Trinity? Oh my, it looks like Lizzie is trying to engage in so-called apologetics. Let's see what's going on over there, Cookie. Here we go. No, do you? Bye bye, Hamza. Do you? What do you mean? Because you know, Jesus, if he is part of a trinity, he ordered the slaughter of millions. And you know that. Ah, the stupid! It burns! Ah! Must retreat! Wait, where did she go? While Cookie is off enjoying herself in Salmon Paradise, I decided to respond to a fairly new argument, at least it seems fairly new, in Islamic apologetics. Be honest, this goes on the top 10 list of bad apologetic arguments that I've ever heard. How bad? About as bad as Stephen Anderson's burnt Jesus offering argument. You say, wait a minute. Jesus said it is finished on the cross. And people will say, see, he'd already done everything we needed for salvation when he said it is finished. So there's no way that he had to go to hell to suffer for our sins. He'd already paid it all. He said it is finished. Now hold on a second. Jesus Christ would not only die on the cross physically, take a physical beating, physically be spat upon, but actually be punished for our sins by suffering the flames of hell. And so when he said it is finished, he's saying his life is finished. His earthly ministry is finished. His work on this earth had been finished. Yep, it is that bad. So let us listen to what Hamza Mayat, a Dawa practitioner at Speaker's Corner in England, has to say. Obviously this came with her agenda. She came with a script. She wanted to try and turn people against Islam using this blasphemy thing. Now, I don't really approve of Fander Ministries, nor am I trying to defend them in this video. Liz seems like she's new to the whole thing and seems to be caught up in the emotionalism that seems to capture most Christians in America today. However, when I have seen some of the content on EF Dao or Yaya Snow's channel, then what I see is an Islamic counterpart of Fander Ministries who uses similar quote mining tactics as well as emotional pleas without wishing to perform Dawa on a reasonable level, a reasonable scale. I have actually dealt with Muslims who display this behavior, but I also have met my fair share of good ones, and even one of my Muslim friends said once I showed him this video that he couldn't even listen to more than four seconds of it because of Hamza. When I told him about my video project, he told me that in one case that Hamza's you know, behavior and attitude was kind of in contrast and contradiction with Surah 29, Ayah 46, which reads according to the clear Quran translation, do not argue with the people of the book unless gracefully, except with those of them who act wrongfully, and say, we believe in what has been revealed to us, and what was revealed to you. Our God and your God is one, and to him we submit. Now, I have looked into the scholars, of course, regarding this understanding and this interpretation, and some of the modern ones are mixed, but classical scholars like Al Jalalain seem to be very clear that the passage seems to indicate warfare and not exactly your everyday Dawa situation. However, while people like Ibn Kathir, Islam's respected tafsir scholar, can say it's about debate, not only does he seem to imply being gentle is already part of debate, but that if one is stubborn and arrogant, you should progress to the point of combat, which seems to indicate physical violence. 
Yeah, sounds real peaceful and loving if you want to use the tactic of, but they were the ones who act wrongfully against us Muslims argument in light of this verse. So I just want to inform you guys of this before we move on, since I can tell Hamza might be a special case here. We know Jesus told his disciples to buy swords. What for? We don't know. Actually, I go over this verse in my video response to Incognito Islamic Productions. If you want to check it out, feel free to see this video. For a short summary though, it basically is to have self-defense permissible as well as self-defense for the disciples when Jesus would get caught. Okay, we know Jesus says, bring the mine enemies before me and slay them those who do not listen to me. Okay, who is this king in this parable? Yeah, we know it's about Jesus, but we'll dive more on this verse later. What's he telling us here? When Jesus returns, he's going to butcher and slaughter everybody who rejected him. This peaceful, loving Jesus. And how do we know this? Because we know according to Christianity, Jesus is one third of a trinity. What does that mean? Three in one. Wait, what? What does the Trinity have to do with the whole argument you were just now making? So when God speaks in the Old Testament and orders the slaughter of innocents, it's Jesus ordering the slaughter of innocents. Now my response is, well that's stupid. You cannot escape it. If you're a Trinitarian Christian, Jesus in the Old Testament is God of the Old Testament as you claim he's God now. You'd actually have a good point, Hamza, if you even came close to knowing what the doctrine of the Trinity was to start with. It's clear I'm gonna need to have to prescribe you something later after this. So Jesus orders the slaughter of millions in the Old Testament. Jesus tells his disciples to buy swords. Jesus instructs to slay those who will not hearken to him. And tells the disciples that anyone who doesn't hearken to him, when he returns, he'll slaughter them all and then throw them in hell. Just wait for it. And look at the history of Christianity. Look at the butchers that took place between Christians. Brother Adnan spoke about Michael Servetus. Who is Michael Servetus? I'm pretty poor Christians, pretty sure Christians don't know who he was. Oh, trust me, I know exactly who he is. He was a man who didn't believe in the divinity of Jesus and he wrote a book against the divinity of Jesus and when he went to Luther during or Calvin one of the two during the Reformation he didn't realize that it was only rejecting the uh, Pope and the hierarchy of Catholicism rather than the Trinity and he was put on trial as a heretic and he was burned at the stake with his book tied to his belt as a warning to anybody who tried to challenge the divinity of Jesus. This is Christianity. Oh my god! Holy cow! That's like me pointing out to the times in Islamic history where people have done something in the name of Islam just like what Lizzie did to you. So Adnan Rashid was slowly turning into Lizzie when he mentioned Severitas. These are simply fallible men who made a mistake in deciding to kill somebody in the same way the Crusades and the persecutors of the reformers did. Calvin and Luther were not perfect men who I even disagree with both sometimes when it comes to certain perspectives. Because I hold the Bible as the higher authority in terms of doctrine, and they expected others to do the same. Now to go on to the Luke 19.27 passage, which is the end of the parable of the ten minus. It's pretty self-explanatory. So I'll just suggest reading Luke 19 verses 11 through 27 before continuing the video if you aren't familiar with the story. So. How do we make sense of this particular parable? Well, if you go to the book of Revelation, which talks of the second coming, we see in Revelation 17, 12 through 14, that the ten horns, which represent ten kings of ten nations that will join with the beast, the devil, in raging war with the lamb, Christ. Thus, right here we see that Jesus has enemies, but they aren't just simply unbelievers. They aren't just simple unbelievers that we see day to day. No, they are unbelievers who have joined to rage war and attempt destroying Christ. Now, Revelation 19 verses 11 and 14 reveal not only that Jesus is going to be coming down on a white horse, but that Jesus will be followed by an army in heaven to rage war against them. In verse 19 to 21, we read that Jesus will destroy the army, and after having sent the beast, the false prophet, and the followers who accepted the mark of the beast into the fire, it says the remnant were executed by the sword. While there is debate as to what is meant by the word sword here in the text, there's not really much debate as to who the remnant are. 
that is, the kings. Some like Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown in their commentary, note this includes the armies, but for argument's sake, let's assume they took the mark of the beast. The kings would probably not be ones who took the mark, but rather are just the starting pawns in the beast's plan to rebel against Jesus. So, these can easily be allowed of Jesus, but Christians aren't told to go kill. That is Jesus' job to those who rebel against him in accordance with the prophecy in Revelation when he returns in the second coming. Jesus never commands his followers to go out and commit some form of jihad or to kill the apostates or non-believers. You will not find that anywhere within the text, no matter how desperate or hard you even try. Now Lizzie here says, where did Jesus instruct this? Unfortunately for Lizzie, Christianity is not what Jesus taught. Jesus didn't teach original sin. Jesus didn't teach salvation from the cross. Jesus didn't teach this stuff. He didn't teach original sin because his Jewish audience and whom he preached to was already familiar with it. I mean, after all, you can read this in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, Jeremiah 17, verse 9, as well as plenty other verses that I can go into a whole video to affirm on this. As for salvation by the cross, he didn't have to say by the cross, but he came preaching salvation. If you haven't read John chapter 3 or any of the Gospels, then I don't know what to say to you. This came after. Jesus didn't teach the Holy Spirit is the God. No, but his followers, especially Peter, did. Read Acts chapter 5. Peter uses God and Holy Spirit interchangeably in these passages. These are all what Christianity teaches. So if you're a Christian, you cannot hold on to the words of Jesus alone because it's not enough. Because if you hold on to the words of Jesus alone, you'll be a Muslim. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Sorry that it was Jesus who converted me to Christianity alone. Not to mention, I can make parallels which show Paul and Jesus taught the same thing. Not only that, but Paul got his teachings from Jesus' followers. Like Peter in Galatians chapter 1, verses 15 through 19, where Peter visits him for 15 days. Now, the Greek word for visit is historio. And if you look at an English-Greek lexicon of the word, you will find that it means to get information from. So Paul went and visited Peter and gathered information and learned from Peter for 15 days. Therefore, it confirms they had plenty of time to learn about Christianity to confirm that what Paul was preaching was true and was in line with the historic Christian faith of which that Paul and Jesus taught. If you want to claim to be a Christian today, don't hide behind Jesus and say, where did Jesus do this? Where did Jesus do that? Because that ain't Christianity. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So in which one actually copies the tactics of J. Smith and company. Plus, Mr. Myatt has the tragic I don't understand the Trinity disease. It's a very damaging disease, but can be treated if the patient is quick to follow my instructions in regards to these prescriptions. Prescription 1. Pick up a copy of the Bible, preferably ESV or NASB for better results. Make sure to study and test if your claims are accurate. Prescription 2. Consult an online Hebrew or Greek lexicon of the Bible in order to understand the original language of the Bible. Prescription 3. Eat plenty of salmon. Trust me. Prescription 4. Get a conservative Bible commentary. Why conservative? Don't question the doctor known as Cookie. Prescription 5. Drink plenty of water. And finally, Prescription 6. Consider an online lecture mp3 audio file or course on the trinity this should help out your current conditions mr myatt now don't forget to tip nurse ca the price of three salmon fillets and we'll see you next time wait why do i have to be the nurse <laughs>